right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's four o'clock. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, this is um, Bill Erickson's Angular Client Ingredients. Um, my name is Amy Terlaga. I'm from Bibliomation. We're based in Connecticut. We are sponsoring this Zoom session. Um, closed captioning is being sponsored by Equinox Open Library Initiative, and we'd like to thank our captioner who has worked tirelessly all afternoon. Um, uh, again, this is meeting mode, not webinar mode. So that means please leave your video off and your mic off um, unless you have um, questions throughout the presentation. I think Bill said he'd be comfortable with taking questions um, uh, verbally and not. Uh, but you, if you're more comfortable with chat, then then go ahead and use the chat. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce Bill Erickson. Bill, take it away. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, hi, everyone. I have no idea who I'm talking to. I'm going to pull up the participant list just real quick. Uh, I haven't seen you all in so long, uh, and I was really looking forward to seeing everybody. Uh, so I'll just look at your names instead and say hi. I, um, and I don't have the chat open uh, if, oh, wait, there's the chat window. Okay. I'll pull that open too. I may, I may not see everything that's going on there, uh, but I'll try to glance over there occasionally. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about Angular today. Um, as is often the case with my talks, it's pretty code heavy. And I, I, I do these as much for myself as something I can return to later as a reference. So um, some of this may be a little eye glazy at times. Um, and I'll try to keep it uh, moving along and, and, and kind of light. Uh, it, is, it is a little bit sort of short attention span theater because there's no, there's no story arc or narrative here. It's, it's pretty um, random mix of stuff. Uh, so the idea was to uh, talk about the kind of the main pieces that we use when we're building interfaces on the Angular side. And there's certainly a lot of that going on, but uh, I also wanted to make a point of mentioning things that have come up or been problematic to me or certain themes that I see over and over that I, um, um, you know, might have some, uh, some advice to offer on. So I, there's a fair amount of that going on too. Uh, and and uh, like Amy said, I'm happy to uh, take questions anytime. Uh, in fact, it's probably a good way to pause me for a second. Um, but um, otherwise, I will go ahead and uh, get started. I don't want to spend too much time on some of the really obvious things. Um, my first slide here is about the grid. The grid is one of those things that is in almost every interface. And whether or not you want to or care about it, you will eventually understand for the most part how it works because it's so ubiquitous. So uh, I thought I would just mention one or two less obvious things. Uh, one of my favorite things, one, th one thing I make a point of doing now, uh, anytime I build a grid is, um, I try to imagine, you know, the, the the ideal layout for someone using the interface. And of course, we one of the things we can do is define specific columns that show up by default, and then we have the other columns that can be added uh, as needed. Uh, but another thing we can do is we can tell the columns how wide they should be by default. And I don't know how common knowledge this is, but there's a, a flex attribute, which I will highlight here with my mouse, uh, which allows you to set a proportional width for a column. Uh, and so if you have a grid with something like an ID column, which is generally going to be fairly, fairly narrow, it's just a number, and you have something else uh, like a title, say on a bib record, then you're going to want the title column to be wider by default. And if you, so you can just set a flex value. This is basically saying the uh, title column is three times the size of the ID column. And um, this gives you a chance to create something that at first glance makes more sense to anyone using the system and it means they're less likely to have to go in and change the column sizes and save the settings for themselves. Something else that's a little bit less known that's fairly recent is uh, this idea of a cell text generator. So um, we have, <clears throat> uh, someone just asked if they should be hearing audio. I am talking. So I assume someone's hearing audio but I would like to confirm that. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. So it seems like audio in general is, is working. 
um, one of the features that uh, is available in the grid is the ability to print it in sort of a tabular form or to export it as CSV. But you can also create grid cells that have complex data that isn't just text. And I have a picture at the top here of uh, from the Angular catalog of the barcode column where it lists the barcode and it shows a link to view it and it shows a link to jump to the edit interface. Um, so if you went to print something like this, then it would just be a big chunk of HTML that didn't make a whole lot of sense in that column. So the way to uh, allow for a better formatting of those types of data are to create this thing called a cell text generator on the grid. And um, anytime it finds a column that has a cell template defined, it'll look to see if there's a generator for it in the code. And so here we have a column named barcode and we've defined a generator, a very simple one down here that simply says, when you need the data for this column, instead of rendering this complex HTML, just render the barcode. Uh, and we will see these also in the, um, uh, in the console, in the JavaScript console, where if you have a template and you don't define a matching generator, it'll get a warning reminding you to uh, do so. <clears throat> Another handy widget um, is the uh, org family uh, select. And this allows you to specify a chunk of the org in a tree. So typically we have library selectors that allow you to pick a library, a specific uh, org unit. Uh, this one lets you decide on an org unit and then say whether or not you want to include all the child org units and or all the parent org units. Uh, and this, this comes in handy in, in a number of places, especially in the admin interfaces or um, sort of in grid filtering context. And under the covers, this looks a bit like this. And just the main thing I wanted to point out is that um, the, the model that allows you to track the values selected in that selector are, um, <clears throat> they're gonna tell you the primary org ID, which is what shows up here, and whether or not either of those checkboxes are selected. And then dep depending on the, uh, the um, situation of either of these, uh, it'll include additional org or it'll include the selected plus additional org units in this array here. So it makes um, building queries based on a user selection here pretty simple. Date range selectors. We have there are multiple date pickers. Uh, there's a date time picker. There's a date picker. This is one of the more interesting ones, just because it allows you to uh, select date range. Uh, you'll see this in the booking reservation page. Uh, at least that's one place I know it shows up. And um, you can, you pick a start date and then you can, you know, page through months to pick an end date to get whatever range you need. And then you can see at the bottom here kind of what that model looks like under the covers. Once the, uh, once the value is set, then you will have an object with these uh, two different components in it. On the Angular side, um, the access keys, which are the keyboard shortcut commands, are it's it's uh, the code to do that is uh, homegrown. Uh, we don't have a third-party uh, dependence uh, for that, um, and that was something that um, that was a decision I made. I, I for, for certain since given the you know the 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 complexity of Node and managing dependencies, if there are certain things that can be done and 30, 40 lines of code, then sometimes it's easier just to do that uh, in the long run. So um, that's where this came from. And uh, so if you're in <clears throat> all the Angular interfaces and you type control H, it'll give you this list of uh, keyboard commands that are registered in the interface. And um, it will give you the, uh, the command, the uh, sort of the label or the action that's documented with the command, where the command is defined and whether or not it's active. If a command shows no as active, then that means a command was registered later on that precedes or supersedes, I should say, uh, an existing command. So it sort of overwrites one. Um, and under the covers, that looks like this. Not, not too different from the AngularJS uh, markup that you might see for this, but um, we have a uh, directive context, which is uh, the navbar over here. And then in this case, we have two different uh, key commands, which will fire this action description, 
all of these are marked as I18N so that you can change the keyboard commands and the descriptions. And then of course the text itself is I18N. Um, and then as far as the action goes, since it's a regular anchor, it can be an href, a router link, or a click command. Any of those will be fired when the uh, key in question is fired. So jumping back here, we have two different check-in entries, one for, sorry, uh, patron search, one for F4, one for alt S. Uh, I can see an argument for collapsing those down into one row. That's just how it looks now. This is probably the most eye glazy one, uh, but I thought it worth mentioning. Um, it's two things on here I wanted to mention um, that are relatively new <clears throat> in, on the Angular side. The first is this thing called flesh selectors in PCRUD. Um, this is a replacement for manual flesh entries, and it's specifically related to when a class in the IDL has a field, which is a link, and that field and the, the destination for that link is another class, which has a field described as a selector. Um, and you've seen this kind of thing in, um, say, like a, a drop down. So you're, you want to list um, your copy statuses in a drop down so you can pick a status. That label that displays for available or checked out or whatever, those are generally that's coming from it's being labeled that we want this name field to be called a selector. So um, and, and it comes up in a lot of contexts, especially in admin interfaces. If uh, so, instead of having to think about how you want to flesh all these things, you can just tell it to grab all the things that look like we might want to display a name for them as opposed to say an identifier. The second part of this is there is a thing called the format service. You can pass it all kinds of data and it will figure out what to do with it and figure out how to display it. It's good with um, dates. You can tell it to display dates and times. It's a uh, you know, locale and time zone aware. Um, uh, it has logic for displaying Boolean values and, and strings and all kinds of stuff. Um, but one of the things it knows how to do is if you pass it a, an object that's defined in the IDL, then um, it knows uh, whether or not a certain field links to a selector class. And then it will look to see if that field has a fleshed version of it available. If it does, it will display the selector value. So in this case, I had console log metative field class and then told the transform to enter the remainder of the value. Typically what you'd see here is metative field class and then an identifier, but instead we're seeing metative field class and then the name of the uh, object. So anytime you have an IDL object and you want to display a column and you don't want to have to think about it or you want to automate the process, uh, then this, the, the formatter comes in handy. Another new interface component, or relatively new, this was added uh, along with the um, Angular Mark editor. Uh, I keep looking up in my face and I see I'm just drifting off camera. Um, <clears throat> This is added along with the Angular Mark Editor, and here you can see the, the it being used in that context. It's um, a, a very simple thing to add. So it's essentially a list of key value pairs, and you uh, take a, an input, and you tell it that you want it to be a context menu, tell it about its list, and you tell it what to do when uh, an a item in here is selected. And then as far as the entries, you're just giving it a set of key value, or <clears throat> excuse me, uh, value label pairs. So in this case, I have a component or something with an array of things called stuff. And then we just map those out and then they're gonna end up in the uh, context menu. Uh, one thing of note on the chunk of code down here is um, I have these parentheses here. Uh, some of you who are familiar with the arrow notation for functions, you, um, you don't have to have function brackets if you're just doing one line of code. But if your one line of code is an object that starts with brackets, then you're going to confuse the compiler and it's going to, um, it's going to expect you to have that. Um, uh, it, it thinks that it's the beginning of a function when, you, when it sees this uh, bracket here. So you can get around that by just putting in parentheses and then it knows that whatever's inside the parentheses is the single return value. Or you could just go with a full-fledged function and have a return value. So either way works fine. Uh, 
this um, <clears throat> this to me, and we have the same thing on the Angular JS side, and it's one of the more kind of clunky uh, and uh, frustrating parts of the development process. Uh, we have this thing called the string component, which the reason we have it is because we don't want to just put bare strings into code because then we can't translate them to other languages. So um, we take advantage of the IATNIN functionality built in uh, in Angular or uh, on the AngularJS side built into the template toolkit, and we so that, that way we can so we can define strings in the templates that are translated in the templates, and then those strings are accessed uh, in various by various mechanisms in the code. But so this is a fairly simple example uh, where you're just defining a string, giving an identifier, and then giving it some text, and then you can access that text in various ways. Here's a significantly more complicated example where you're adding logic to the um, template that renders the string value. And then you are telling the string to use specific data at runtime to fill in the, uh, the template so that it can apply the logic based on the, the, that individual tab and query value. So this is a lot to type. Just, just to say search colon um, piano music. That's all this boils down to. So, uh, but I, I, I'm just here to say that there is some hope that uh, for the future of this, uh, this is going to be a lot easier. As of uh, Angular 9, which we have not migrated to yet, they have introduced a, um, I don't know if it's a, a, a service or I don't know what they're calling it exactly, uh, but uh, there's a, a way where you can type code into, or excuse me, type strings into the actual TypeScript code and tag that as being translatable. So in the end, we would have all of this would be replaced with something pretty close to this. It would have a, a like a little variable at the end. Um, so that's extre extremely exciting uh, and I can't wait to start using that. There is a caveat, however, with Angular 9, at least at the time uh, when I was last reading about this, that um, the code which generates translations is not yet capable of reading the translations from the TypeScript code. So you have to manually add them to the, um, uh, I guess it's the XMB files that we generate that we then upload to uh, the uh, translation service. So that might get in the way of using it uh, uh, for Angular 9 but it does seem like there is at least, um, this, is, this is great progress. That's, that's probably the hardest part that we've already taken care of. Uh, and so now it's just a question of teaching the, um, the NG, um, I forgot what it's called, but there's a command that generates the uh, translation files. So those will have to be taught how to read the stuff out of the code. And then we can get rid of a lot of this stuff. Something new that was just merged on our way to wrapping up the current batch of releases was a, um, a new addition to the IDL uh, called config field. You can see it down here in the example. And uh, this is a, a handy marker in the IDL which says when you are rendering uh, rows of this type of data in a grid, or potentially other contexts, but at starter, for starters, this was for administrative grids, then use cons render this field as a link to another table, which is, you know, has a relationship to the, uh, to the first class. So the example that came up in Launchpad that was sort of the first example working was um, the <clears throat> Z39 source attributes field. So you have a, a Z39 server essentially so um, LC, OC, LC, et cetera. And then linked to that is a set of attributes that you use for searching. And uh, before we had this uh, functionality, there was no way to jump from one to the other. And in fact, there was no way to get to the secondary interface at all. So now that we have that, you can go to the uh, C3950 source page and we have an actual link here for the attributes. If you click on the attributes for this source, then it's going to add a, first of all, it's gonna take you to the attributes page and it's going to filter the results to those that relate specifically to the uh, LC 
um, C39 source. I'll show what that looks like. Well, it's kind of a limited picture, but um, this would be the, this is the attributes grid. And the, the reason it's small is I wanted to capture this part along the top here. There's um, two ways to apply filtering to a grid. There's via the URL, and that's, what's, uh, that's what I'm talking about here. And it, it shows the filters that are applied via the URL, and it gives you an option to clear those filters so that you can view all the items. Um, and then that leads me into the more general purpose grid filters. Uh, these have been around a little bit longer, but um, you can, this is something that's turned on per grid, and these are inline filters, and they uh, provide different options for, um, a, I should have got a picture of the drop down, but it's sometimes it's hard to do that because the, you know, it loses focus and then it disappears. Uh, but it gives you different options for um, uh, filtering. So uh, over here on the string value, exa uh, uh, for example, little that you do uh, starts with greater than, less than, that kind of thing. Over here under the hook column, this is a, essentially a primary key value. So all you do is say equals or doesn't equal or is exactly in effect. But these, uh, this functionality is there for grids. Uh, I want to point out though, when you're using this, you do have to, as with all of the other grid data, you have to wire it up and get it working the way you want it to work. So under the covers, this guy, um, when you're providing data for the grid, there's going to be an extra attribute on your data source called filters. And it's going to have one or more uh, uh, filters attached to it based on the uh, name of the uh, column. Uh, and then a filter clause under there. <clears throat> and then you essentially, you essentially add these to uh, the query that you are making to retrieve data from the server. Typically a pcred query, but uh, it could be expanded out to other APIs that, are, that know how to uh, read this. Another fairly new thing on the Angular side are server print templates. I don't think many people have had much opportunity to interact with these yet. Uh, there's only two examples in the master server right now. Uh, one is just a, an example of how to, uh, uh, that ports over the patron address template. And since we're still using AngularJS for all of that patron stuff, it's, it's not something anyone's really had to interact with yet. And the second one is a holds for bib record template and that's part of the uh, staff, the experimental staff <clears throat> Angular catalog. So again, not a lot of people have really had need to look at these, but um, it will become more important uh, as, as we move more interfaces to Angular. And the, uh, the, the general concept, it's, it's fairly similar to an action trigger type thing, although it's focused specifically on printing. Um, you have these template toolkit templates that, are, that form the basis of the template. Um, and uh, they have a fairly narrow set of functionality as far as what they can do. And from the client, you pass in uh, a template data object, and then it just gets rendered into here and then returned to the client uh, as an HTML page. And then the client just uh, renders that either through hatch or, or via local printing. And then that gets sent off to uh, the printer. Uh, so, and the main reason I bring it up here is it has, um, uh, it, like I said, it'll be needed more for the new interfaces. Uh, but it does allow you to do things like uh, uh, apply a locale to a template. So if you had a staff member logged in at a different locale, or um, say, for example, uh, you, you knew a patron's uh, sort of default language was different, then you could, uh, you know, you could take advantage of that in different contexts. Um, so these will, these will start showing up more as people start porting interfaces over. And uh, this is the uh, UI, the, the admin UI for managing those. Uh, but of course, when new interfaces are added, we'll need C data in the database for those. A topic that's come up quite a few times uh, in recent memory uh, in, in IRC and in Launchpad is um, the, the wonderful power that we have with uh, being able to essentially broadcast uh, huge numbers of API calls to the server. Uh, either you know, through the XML HTTP stuff or through WebSockets, uh, it, really, it really kind of dry, you know, encourages you it, it, for the sake of speeding up the interface to parallelize a lot of data collection, send a lot of the stuff off at once. And um, 
for various reasons, this being one of them, we have seen uh, certain cases where the server is just getting, you know, hit with way too many requests at once. Uh, and so something that I've started doing is uh, being a little bit more conscious of this uh, when I, especially on um, any type of batch operation or a page load operation. So this is something that I, I might have written some time ago where I, I wanted to load four different things simultaneously as a certain page or a component was loading. And so these would all get blasted off at once. Your server gets hit with four requests. And, you know, generally it's not that big of a deal. Evergreen is, is, does, does well with parallelized processing. But if you are sending off too many, it can be problematic because you're exhausting resources on the back end. So just kind of the alternate version of that that I, I've started doing now is um, I tend to, by default, make sure that everything is loaded in serial so that one client is making a request, getting a response, making a request, getting a response, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll do this as my default. Uh, and this is a very typical, I have, in most of my components, I have a load function that looks almost exactly like this. Uh, now, of course, if you find scenarios where it really just needs to be a little bit faster, uh, then one option is doing more parallelization, more akin to this. Um, but another option, which I've also started doing more and more of, is um, you know turning these four calls into a single API call that is uh, custom built for this interface. That way, you benefit both from the speed of doing four things at once, and uh, uh, while at the same time only having to send to one API call to the server. So, and some of these things that I'm suggesting are, you know, I, it's just stuff that I've come across and things that work well for me. Um, there. I'm, most of this, I'm not saying it's some kind of gospel. It's just kind of how I found it to be uh, working well for me and, and what I think probably makes sense in most cases. Um, so with, you know, toward the end, when we're, if, if there's any questions, if, uh, if there's any comments about any of this stuff, I'm definitely glad to hear it. <laughs> like I said, this is uh, all over the place. Um, it's, it's basically I take notes when I'm writing code about stuff that confuse me, and then I come back and uh, talk about it. Um, the, uh, as of Angular 8, uh, some of you have noticed uh, that it's hard to merge changes between Angular 8 and Angular 7, which would be Evergreen 3.5 versus Evergreen 3.4, um, that because there's a new uh, required field on this thing called view child in the Angular components. Uh, view child is a way to get references to child components in the page. Um, so just to kind of demystify the addition that came in Angular 8, the, um, the, the flag called static can be true or false. And um, <clears throat> if the value is set to false, that means that this my component variable is not available until the after view init hook. Um, so I don't know if everyone's really spent much time on this one. Um, Angular has various what they call lifecycle hooks so that you know at a certain point in page rendering what has happened and what has not happened yet. Um, so after view init is uh, a little bit later on in the process and more of the page components have been fleshed out at this point. If the value is set to true, then you have access to this variable earlier on in the on init function. Um, my default going forward is been to use false. Uh, and that's based on the uh, fact that as of Angular version 9, that will be the assumed default, uh, which means that uh, we won't have to have these in the code anymore. And in fact, I believe the migration tool will remove them for us. Um, and also, the other part is. They, they, they basically say that you only really need this uh, under kind of unusual circumstances, atypical circumstances. So I, I generally just move everything to uh, using false going forward. And then just being aware of when this, uh, this um, variable can be accessed. And uh, related to that, when we have child components like this, so I have a component within a page with an identifier of loading progress. Um, you do have to be careful, regardless of all of this, 
when you do this dot my component, or in this case, this dot loading progress. Because depending on how you have defined whether or not this component even exists, if it doesn't exist, then that is going to throw an exception because it comes into and out of existence based on its uh, existence in the uh, page. So an example of why it wouldn't exist at the page is if you were wrapped in a NGF block and this variable was set to false, this would not exist. And if you tried to use it, you would get an exception. As a comparison to that, if you did something like a hidden block, which does not prevent this from existing, it simply prevents it from displaying, then you can reference this thing anytime after the after view init, because it won't ever disappear once it's been uh, put into uh, existence. Uh, one caveat about that, if this is a giant complicated component, then you don't want to just hide it because if it's hidden, it's still in the DOM and it's still occupying memory and resources. So that is a case where you would want to prevent, uh, you know, the component from existing at all and do more of an NGF type thing. But if it's something tiny, like a little progress dialog, then this might, uh, then this is, I think you can get away with that, not too much trouble. <clears throat> this confused me a lot when I first started using Angular because it's different from AngularJS. And I'll show an example uh, in, uh, in just a second. But the general idea is if a component exists in Angular and there's no reason for it to go away while performing actions like changing your route or changing other variable data, then the component isn't going to be torn down and rebuilt and reinitialized and reinstantiated and all of that stuff. For uh, speed reasons, it's going to stay exactly as it was. So if you want these sort of child components to be able to, re to respond to external stimuli, like a route change or an input variable change, then you have to teach it to do that. Uh, so I was just gonna show a quick example of that real quick. This is the uh, Angular catalog um, and it's a search result set and I'm on the title detail page. The, um, <clears throat> so we have two main components that we're looking at here. We have the bib summary along the top and the tab that's currently being displayed, just the mark HTML tab. So this uh, component was taught to, <clears throat> excuse me, respond to route changes. It's probably not so easy to make out over the uh, interface, but up here you can see there's a, a bib record ID in the route. So if I click next, that bib record ID changed and the HTML changed. And the reason it changed is because it was taught uh, to watch for changes in the route. And when it detects those to re-render itself using the appropriate identifier. Same kind of thing happens up here, but this bib summary is more of a general purpose component that doesn't know anything about the route. So it knows to watch for changes to its input variables and to refash and re-render itself as needed. So the way that looks in the code is The two different types, again, route level changes is the first one here. This is a, a typical thing that I have uh, in a lot of interfaces that I make. You will subscribe to the um, activated route param map. This is a, um, an observable that fires every time anything up in that URL changed. That, well, <clears throat> there's a caveat to that, but that's, that I'll say that's not important for now. Um, anything I care about is going to show up in this subscription. And so, and it does show, it does fire once on page load. So you don't have to do this logic once and then do it again inside of here. You can do it all inside of the subscription. Uh, but basically I'm saying, all right, what record ID is mapped up here in this URL? Uh, is it different than the one I've already loaded? All right, let's go ahead and load it. We're going to reinitialize ourselves. And then Going back to the uh, alternate form, watching for input changes. And again, that would be kind of like the uh, record summary here. Um, it has uh, an input and instead of just being a variable, it's a set function and a get function. And the set function 
is watching for changes, of course. And uh, it does some similar logic. If, if the ID that was provided is not the same as the one I'm already tracking, then I will uh, reload myself. The one caveat here is you don't want to do this before init has run, because typically that's when you do the first load of data. So you don't want to do this before that and then run it again, because then you're just duplicating effort. So I've taken to um, tracking whether or not this code has completed, uh, and then only then, and once after that's done, will I ever reload based on uh, a change in input. Because you have to be careful, these will get undefined data. Uh, at, you know, it, it, the functions are called at every level of the process. So if a record ID isn't being passed in yet, then you're gonna get nulls here and undefines and things like that. So you have to be conscious of what's coming in. <clears throat> I mention this only because it's uh, going back to those uh, themes and patterns that I see over and over. The, um, the introduction of observables uh, is uh, very powerful and we use it for all the network call stuff because it lets you process streams of data, uh, unlike standard uh, web promises, which are basically just a tr essentially a true false type thing. Um, I mean, they can return different data types, but they're one or the other response, success or not success. Whereas the observables give you um, result, 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 success, or somewhere along the lines, possibly an error. Uh, but one time, often you'll see things where we want to process a stream of information, but then the caller just wants to promise yes or no that it's done. You could do that with observables, but in some cases, they may, you know, the, the library or the API may already be expecting a promise. So this is a common workflow I see or I use a lot in my to process one thing at a time because I'm expecting, say, maybe a large list of them, uh, which means I don't want to grab them all in one chunk. I want to grab a stream of them. So then as that stream comes in, I can pass it off to some function using uh, this tap function, which is part of the observable API. So you're generating, a, uh, <clears throat> generating observable, piping that observable, and then you're saying, I just want to look at what's in there. I don't want to do anything to it. I just want to look at what's in there, take it, pass it off to some function, uh, and then just turn the whole thing into a promise. And then you can be compliant with the uh, calling code that wants a promise instead of an observable. You'll see this quite a bit. Uh, other, other times you'll see, um, you know, you'll see this mixed in with um, merging and merge mapping. And then that, that's a case where you're just taking multiple observables and coalescing them into one. So this is just some suggestions uh, that I have for development that I uh, wrote down um, that come up for me every now and then. So I thought that might be helpful. First and foremost, I always always recommend that you uh, symlink your web build path in, in the repository. This is the, the place where ng build puts the output. Symlink that into your install path. And uh, then open up a separate terminal, terminal, run your ng build watch. And then, you know, every time you hit save in the browser, you just deploy the updates. You don't have to do anything else. Hit save, toggle over to your browser, hit refresh, and then there's your code changes. So it's a lot easier than copying stuff around or certainly not doing a make install. Uh, you, can, you can code really quickly with uh, this setup. Um, for those of you who have done work on the Angular side, you may have uh, been greeted by this page unexpectedly sometimes, or even better, this page. Um, there's a certain level in the Angular routing process where if it bombs out, if there's an exception thrown, then it's unable to complete the routing and it will just send you back to the home page or the base page, I should say. Or in some cases, it won't even do that. It'll just, you know, it'll throw up its hands and quit. Um, I always bookmark the URL I'm working on. Uh, and that way, uh, if this happens, you can just get right back to it instantly. Because when this happens, you can't just click the back arrow to get back where you want to go. Because it's essentially, it won't route to that anymore because it knows it's broken. Uh, even after you reload, once it goes back, it's going to go back to the last successful route. It's, um, you know, it's a little bit annoying when it first happens. But uh, if you put a link up there to get to it quickly, then uh, it's, it's not too troublesome. Uh, for those of you using uh, uh, Vim as a text editor, uh, I'm sure there are other similar options for other text editors. Uh, I recommend adding this to your VimRC file. All this does is remove trailing white space 
from uh, TypeScript files. Uh, you know, I'm sure you, there's other files you might want to add it to, but this is really handy for um, uh, running ng-lint. So one of the things our lint configuration says is that we don't want trailing white spaces in the code. So instead of having to go in and you know regex out those by hand afterwards, you can set this up and it'll, they're, they're cleaned up as you go. I found this to be very handy. And um, the um, the prod versus uh, dev builds in Angular, uh, they, they actually build differently. Uh, the prod builds do a much more deep compilation. Uh, in particular, they dig into the uh, HTML. So um, if you do a prod build, you can get a, you can learn a lot more about problems in the code. It will show you things where you have a, a function defined in the TypeScript, and then you call it in the code with a different number of parameters. Then uh, prod build will tell you that uh, you're calling the function incorrectly, uh, and it'll do lots of other things too. So it's sort of like a uh, a secondary uh, you know error checking tool and uh, something that. Uh, you know, it should always be done before uh, committing uh, or merging the final code anyway. Uh, and then lastly, um, we, uh, back in the, the early days of, uh, of Evergreen, uh, sometimes uh, Mike Rylander and uh, Jason Etheridge and I would do uh, pair programming uh, to, you know, just kind of learn how each other operated. And, and I learned a lot from those guys and decided to kind of continue that tradition. So this is my, uh, my pair programmer um, for the, for now, uh, so he's uh, really good at uh, telling me when I'm doing things uh, the right way. His name is Booger, and he'll let you know what he thinks. So uh, I can open the open the room for questions now. <clears throat> that was a lot. I know that's <laughs> it's kind of a uh, an onslaught of code and information. <clears throat> uh, Booker is a Boston Terrier. Uh, regarding Mike Fisher's question about reviews and cases where you would want to use uh, view child static equals true, um, I, <clears throat> I, I haven't yet. I haven't found a case where it has served me a purpose. They mention in, <clears throat> in the documentation, let me find that link again. Um, and uh, here's the, the URL. And I'll just go ahead and pull that up. Is there a case where I should use static true? Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let you read that, but it's, um, it, it had to do with the situation that it's not something I'd ever really encountered. <laughs> yes, the dog does have an amazing underbite with crooked teeth. Yes, point from Jason uh, regarding the sim link trick. Uh, you do have to be careful with that if you mix that with regular make installs, uh, because uh, then it will it will I think it will choke when it hits that sim link and it can't install on top of it. Uh, and uh, that's an excellent point. I my my uh, sort of local quick installer script moves it out of the way, does the install, and then puts it back into place. Oh, and um, I, uh, the slides I realize are <clears throat> fairly sparse, but um, I will. There, I do have a, a link to them, uh, so that that includes the uh, the slides themselves and the compiled HTML that you can. That's a single file that you can just load up as a file in the browser. <clears throat> 
Um, and just for experimentation sake, I did these in Markdown. I'd never really used it before. So the, the, the bare text might look a little different. I'm looking at IRC too. <laughs> okay, good. It's fairly quiet over there. Um, oh, someone just said my name. Um, uh, all right. Well, it looks like we're we're doing good here. Um, we're we're getting close to time anyway, um, and I believe we have another virtual happy hour at 15 past the hour. So, um, if there aren't any more questions, I'll. Uh, I guess I'll let uh, Amy wrap this up. Well, there was one one last one. Um, how do you like TypeScript? Oh, I missed that. Oh, there we go. Uh, how do you like TypeScript from Jason? Uh, um, I, I absolutely love it. I it's it's um it's a it's a pleasure to work with. Oh yeah, uh, Chris mentions uh, Visual Studio Code as a, a good editor for TypeScript. I've I've used that before as well, and it it is really a handy because uh, it'll give you typing suggestions and um, other kinds of suggestions that are really uh, useful. It'll it'll warn you if you've imported stuff you don't need or if the uh, you're referring to things that don't make any sense all in real time. It's very cool. I believe the. Um, sessions will be uh, links to the recordings will be sent to the mailing list or, or possibly all the attendees. I'm not sure uh, once they've been sorted through and edited. A lot of love for VS Code. Okay, is that it? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, I like your style, dude. <laughs> <laughs>